Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Gaylord National Harbor Convention Center outside Washington, D.C. for the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency's 60th anniversary conference and trade show, the 60th birthday of one of the world's most storied technology organizations. And we're here on the show floor seeing all kinds of fascinating equipment, including talking to fascinating folks like Andrew Nuss, uh, PhD, who is the program manager for Maritime Systems uh, at DARPA. Uh, Andrew, thanks very much uh, for your time. Uh, we know that there's a lot on your portfolio you can't talk about, but there's also some stuff that you can talk about. And I want to start with the Hydra program. Um, utterly fascinating containerized payload system. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the program, what it is, the kind of payloads that could go into it, and why it's so important uh, to the Navy from a maritime surveillance standpoint. So the, the Hydra program was stood up a few years ago, and the, the, the idea over it was um, trying to find a way to develop persistent undersea capabilities. How could we take advantage of the undersea domain and, and build some persistence into that? So there's really two key elements to the program. First was the modular enclosure, and that was the main uh, building block of the system, built around a 40-foot ISO container-sized uh, platform. And then what kind of payloads could you put into that modular enclosure? Uh, so we've we just uh, finished a lot of great, really great testing on the modular enclosure actually last week uh, up at Seneca Lake, a, a Navy facility up there, and showed the ability of this large system to be able to, to dive down to certain depths and be able to re 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 uh, recover from there. Um, uh, concurrent to the modular enclosure development and testing, we also pursued uh, different uh, undersea payloads. So the one that's shown behind me on the, on the, uh, the image there was an undersea payload uh, largely focused on launching and recovering smaller UUVs. So we would uh, enable recharging of the UUVs and also using it as a data exfil uh, node. And that has since transitioned to the Navy for other um, research and development applications. We have uh, pursued and are studying and investigating other uh, payloads for the system um, that will uh, help support the force structure of the future, and we're really excited about it. So the way that we came to the Echo Voyager was a few years ago when Boeing uh, unveiled that they had to uh, had invested quite a bit of money into this program, we said, you know, the, the payloads that we're developing under the Hydra program in the fixed configuration under the modular enclosure, we could likely apply to this uh, larger, uh, extra large EUV um, uh, application. So Echo Voyager is a great uh, example of what an extra large EUV is capable of doing. So we have a really great partnership with Boeing using their vehicle as a test bed uh, and working with them on the uh, uh, on the capabilities and how the system would actually launch payloads. Um, and UUV is an unmanned underwater vehicle and uh, the Echo Voyager is effectively a large unmanned uh, conventionally powered submarine, a diesel electric submarine uh, although some future generations of it may have fuel cell power on it, um, as well as uh, the fascinating uh, uh, General Atomics reactor that produces hydrogen that then, uh, you know, whether General Motors or anybody else's fuel cell, uh, full disclosure, General Motors has sponsored us and is sponsoring us at AUSA uh, at, as well um, in terms of uh, the GM defense uh, division. But, Andrew, talk to us a little bit, you know, you said about a whole variety of undersea payloads. You know, Navy theorists have said, look, we, we can put munitions at the bottom of the ocean, for example, to um, be able to allow us to direct fires and more easily direct fires and pre-position stores. Um, there are those who said, look, we can have a network of unmanned underwater vehicles, but undersea charging stations, for example, where um, you know it, it, transmitting data is very, very hard, but if you have an undersea fiber network, you can have that box under, under the ocean, your data dump, charge up, go back out. What are some of the other kinds of applications? You know, you said that there were some things, some things you can't discuss, but what are, you know, whether it's for sea surveillance, you know, what are the different types of missions that we could see sort of a fixed undersea infrastructure uh, be used for? Uh, yeah, I think the, the, from a fixed infrastructure perspective, the, the underwater, the undersea payload is a good example of uh, a means of building out a larger ecosystem where you could have smaller UUVs, unmanned underwater vehicles, that are able to be recharged and sustained in situ. So it, it kind of takes away the man out of the loop from having to continuously launch and recover these smaller payloads that they could just go and recharge and then continue their operation. So it kind of creates a larger ecosystem that we're interested in. Uh, and that, that technology is uh, transition and there's other efforts at the Office of Naval Research, for instance, that are taking that and building out and actually demonstrating that larger architecture. As far as, far as other missions, there are certainly others that uh, I'm not willing to talk about today, but uh, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance are definitely um, areas that this is a, a very ripe 
uh, domain right now, uh, um, and, and there's a lot of uh, really interesting technologies being invested in the here between DARPA and Office of Naval Research and commercial industry also. This is a great example of a partnership with Boeing who developed this platform under their own uh, internal research and development effort, and, and, and because of that, we can take advantage of that and start to show some interesting applications for it. Um, and the requirement now, I think, is 30 days uh, undersea, uh, or th ability to conduct 30-day missions, mm -hmm. um, whereas I think the ultimate goal is 60-day missions, if I, if I recall, fully submerged uh, to be able to prosecute a long-range uh, mission. Um, let me ask you a question about securing undersea infrastructures. Once upon a time, the U.S. Navy, through its selective deep-sea uh, submarines and specialized submarines, was the only guy who could go to the bottom of the deep ocean and recover anything, uh, whether it was to maintain the SOSIS network uh, or recover missile components and other things. There's been a democratization of this capability. You can now buy an undersea, deep ocean, um, oil repair robot for a couple of hundred thousand dollars that'll operate at 18,000 feet and be able to manip manipulate thousands of pounds of cargo um, with some precision. That means that anything we put on the bottom of the ocean is also potentially vulnerable to another guy. What are some of the thinking you guys are applying to safeguard undersea installations? There was a friend of mine, we were talking about the need to sort of resuscitate and advance the SOSIS network, and he said, look, that was a fixed thing and the Russians couldn't get down there, and now the Russians can get down there, so that makes that undersea structures vulnerable mm -hmm. to tapping and interference. How, what's, what are some, some things and ways that you're thinking about the undersea realm which is enormous opportunity, but now far more contested than it's ever been. Yeah, I, I will say that I, I, our position is we have to recognize that the maritime domain goes down full ocean depth, 6,000 plus meters, and we have to be able to own and operate within that full domain. So we are considering investigating certain technologies that enable us to be able to operate at those depths. As far as the specific applications, I won't discuss those, but we have been looking at ways that we can own uh, and, and also deny that full ocean depth. How do, how, do we, um, how do we take advantage of that and prevent that advantage for others? Um, I, I remember uh, more than 20 years ago when uh, I was uh, talking to Bob Ballard, and I said, you know, well, what's the future of warfare? And he's like, well, the, the deepest oceans are going to be, actually, he said, I foresee, you know, potential future battlefield if you look at technological applications, which is a little bit about what we're uh, talking about here. Um, what do you think are going to be some of the most important technological enablers? Um, is it going to be the advent of more powerful fuel cell pro propelled vehicles? Is it, uh, you know, better lithium ion technology? Um, you know, communications has always been a challenge uh, in terms of make, getting signal through water. What do you think are going to be some of the key enabling technologies insofar as you can discuss them? Yeah, I, th I think one of the biggest challenges in the undersea domain is the communications. And there's two ways to solve that problem. One is to continue to invest in greater communication capabilities or find ways to enhance and improve the autonomy of the systems that are operating in the undersea domain so they don't need to communicate quite as much. So we're, we're looking at both approaches. This is a, a, a ripe environment for for autonomy and for the development of long duration autonomy, not just things that can operate for 24 hours at a time, but things that can operate for 24 days at a time without the need for human intervention. So we're, we're working through the autonomy problem. We have a lot of collaboration amongst other DARPA offices that are really uh, pursuing the science of the autonomy, and then we're looking at the application of it in the maritime domain. Uh, one last question about uh, AI, artificial intelligence. Um, obviously a key priority, the two, uh, very large program that uh, DARPA just announced in order to advance the state of the art um, on uh, artificial intelligence. Talk to us a, a little bit about the importance of AI, especially for ultra long endurance underwater vehicles, given the complexity of the undersea terrain, um, the fact that the adversaries are getting much better, so in contested environments, that, that smarts on the vehicle are going to be very important. Talk to us about the role of AI in the maritime, uh, deep maritime environment in particular. Yeah, I, I think the, the undersea environment is a great place, a great application for artificial intelligence, mostly in better understanding the environment itself. Um, we tend to understand the backside of the moon a little bit better than we do the seabed right now. And, and so using uh, more advanced autonomy approaches to be able to understand that environment, how the environment's changing, how that's affecting the operation that's being conducted, I think that's a ripe area for, uh, for development and for investment. And also as the, the complexity of the missions increase, and again, as the communications become more and more laden, uh, having an artificial intelligence kind of uh, capability kind of helps ride through those uh, there's dormant periods where you can't phone home for help from a human operator.
Andrew Nuss from the uh, Maritime uh, Domain uh, Program Office at DARPA. Thanks very much, best of luck. Really, really cool programs. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. You gotta love any Connex container with ballast tanks on it. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's a very neat thing. It was a very cool, cool test to observe, yeah. How far underwater? <laughs>